Hi, I'm Sylvia Carmen Cubina, Executive Director of the Bath, and I'd like to welcome everybody to Small Talks. Hi, Saveria. How are you? Hi, how are you? <laughs> Great to talk to you today. So today is the first in a series called Small Talks. And um, I'd like to welcome everybody who's here with us today and also thank Art Bridges for their amazing support for this series. Um, it's so important we're all talking now and we're having these amazing conversations. And yesterday I heard this really awesome um, number. Um, we had an AMD conversation yesterday and they said that way more people are joining um, conversations and online and digital platforms. And 40% of the people joining these conversations never set foot in a museum in 2019. Wow. So we're reaching people that we haven't reached before. And that's so exciting for me. That is so amazing. I love that. Oh my goodness. It's wow. awesome. So I hope there are people here who didn't come to a museum last year because I think you're gonna love it. And I think you're gonna love meeting Zavaria Simmons. And, um, and so if you like it, please come to our museum. You can come and you're gonna have a great time as well. So Zavaria Simmons, um, we're here to talk about big things and small things, but this is um, small talks. And I think we kind of need a moment to meet artists and talk about their work, but also talk about small things and have a moment where we're having a little bit of fun and a little bit of joy and we're getting to meet people. So here we are. Um, I'm so, and I'm so happy to be here. I think it's so wonderful. I've, I've been on a lot of heavy talk conversations, which I, I adore and I love, but I'm really excited to kind of lighten the mood because, you know, along with transformation comes a need for you know reflection and also joy we need to have joy through all of this all of this absolutely i think joy is a big part of healing so you have moments that are more intense but then you have joy and you have giggles and it's just all part of healing so yeah. it's important so i'll introduce you to various simmons um a huge body of work um about much about construction of identity um, sound, performance, painting, sculpture, what am I missing, video, photography, you name it. And I want to, before we talk, and you're also a teacher, uh, you were a teacher at Harvard and Yale, or now you're a teacher at Yale, I, maybe I'm getting it wrong. I was last year, um, basically a professor of practice at Harvard, a visiting lecturer. Um, and I've been uh, in residence at Yale and Columbia and um, yeah. Amazing, amazing. Yeah. So before we get into talking about your work and everything, where are you? I am in, in New York City. I am in, so I have a studio in Long Island City and then in my apartment in the city, I have a, like a little studio, like a little mini space that I can do paintings or photographs or um, kind of like home-based. I'm actually a very home-based person. I like being home, although I have to be in a studio to make larger works, but so I'm, I'm actually home. My, the rest of my home is out that door. <laughs> So during this whole pandemic, I think a lot of us have been home a lot and home now means a whole bunch of things. And um, tell me, have you, do you have a new hobby or do you have something that you're cooking or something that you're growing or knitting or mm. that's different now? I mean, Sylvia, I love this. First of all, hi everyone. Um, I love this question because nobody asks me that. I think because of the pandemic and because of the nature of my work, it's it's so you know politically engaged and you know so it's nice to talk about these things also. Um, so when the pandemic started, I actually I love I love cooking as much as I love eating out, but obviously I wasn't we weren't going out as much. So I started ordering a whole bunch of cookbooks. So I got to cooking a lot of things that I like had never, you know, getting deeper into flavors. Like I love um, Thai food or, or Ethiopian food or like you know, Japanese home cooking or Mexican food that's like, you know, home cooking style, you know, so not so much like the things that we uh, 
kind of consume in restaurants, but more like how people cook at home. And I started making my own homemade ice cream with bananas and all kinds of stuff. So I've learned a lot. I've learned how to make a lot of homemade things that I never would have before. And I think I have probably like 15 cookbooks since the pandemic started. Amazing. So give me one top of mind recipe. Like what? Um, made well, I had, I had never, I used to like consume tortillas, for instance, like corn tortillas, but I would, um, you know, buy them nice quality from a farmer's market or, but I learned how to make them by hand. And that's been something, I'm actually gonna make those tonight. Um, and let's see, what else? Uh, I learned how to make some homemade, cause I'm vegan. So I learned how to make some homemade vegan cheeses with cashews and all these types of things. And I learned how to make cocktails. That's another, uh -huh. another thing. And, and how do you say cacio e pepe? Gotcha, okay, okay. I love that. I love that. So we, we make that a lot here now, which is delicious. Um, but cocktails is something that I wasn't really consuming because I drink a lot of wine and all this stuff, but I've been making my own cocktails and that's been fabulous. So <laughs> what about that's you? Wonderful. Have you, <laughs> have you made could, We could probably invite everybody online to contribute their cocktails recipes because I think a lot of people are experimenting with one. I made a French 75 with thyme the other day, like thyme, and it was really delicious. Really that sounds nice. Do you have special glasses? No, no, just a you know regular glass. Um, but yeah, but it's a good project. I'll look into the special glasses. That yeah, be. that's a thing. I think because I'm so interested in because I make things, so everything, you know something like a glass for me is really critical to how I consume because I'm so, in, I'm interested in, you know, how people make things, right? So for instance, my friend Catherine made these, this, and this is just oh, a beautiful, wow. isn't it? She just made this beautiful. gorgeous object and I've been enjoying it in front of my, uh, computer area but I would love to drink a cocktail out of it you know so I've been getting into things like that cool I think that is asking for a cocktail yeah that obviously. exactly Definitely. <laughs> uh, so um I'm looking over your shoulder and I'm seeing some language and I want to you know change the subject for a minute we can go back to cocktails but looking at that painting language is so a part of your work. And the other day, um, I was reading your MoMA um, going through your 24 hours. And I was looking at that and thinking, oh, wow, okay, now I understand this a little more because I saw it sort of like a stream of consciousness where you're, you know, you're serving yourself a cocktail and then you're moving and then you're walking your dog and you're moving on. And I felt like so much stimulus was coming in and I want to ask you if that's how you approach these paintings or how is that methodology? You know, with the, with the paintings, there's a few different kind of ways in. For me, it's part of it is tied to other things I might be researching. So my studio works where I, one part of the practice informs the other. So um, if I'm researching thinking about photography, for instance, and kind of thinking about how to construct an image, I'll oftentimes be taking notes um, on, you know, it could be anything from color to like composition to thinking about materials that I want to use. And then, and then also historical knowledge or uh, archival information. And then those things will um, come into photographs. But then, you know, that knowledge also gets transferred into let's say a painting or a sculptural work. So for me, you know, it's all part of an ecology and none of my writing is really stream of conscious. It, and I'm, you know, it's, it's, it's nice when you do something and, or make something and someone thinks it's something else. So for instance, mm -hmm. none of the writing is stream of conscious. It's, I, I set out to build something. I set out to build a, 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 
an image or basically a film or, or a photograph or a sculpture. And there are things that I can't physically make. So I construct them through the paintings and through the text. And um, so I go, you know, I, I work with language a lot. It's another tool. It's like equivalent to uh, my photography or equivalent to working with um, sculptural materials. It's like, I use the language in the same way um, to build a vision or a structure or a narrative or a landscape or a film or a feeling. Um, that's kind of how I see language, but it, I'm, I'm happy that it feels stream of conscious because that means I, I, the labor that I put in actually makes it feel a little bit like effortless, but it's mm -hmm. actually a lot of labor. So um, should we show sequence? We can, yes. I <laughs> want to. Yeah. So, um, can we show sequence the work that I'm going to ask you about next? We can keep going, yeah. There's yeah, that's there it. we go. Doesn't that look good there, Saveria? Yes, it does. I'm so excited that it's in the Bass collection. It's really um, wonderful, you know, to be there. I can't wait to see it in person and it's in its permanent home. It, it looks amazing and it is an amazing work of art and we're so proud to have it. This is one of our, our most recent acquisitions. Um, and I'd, so let's talk about this work sequence and and tell us about the language and also about the abstraction and just it being a painting. Yeah. So I was actually before I produced this work, I was actually making a larger body of work looking at um, Jacob Lawrence's migration series and also reading a lot about um, sculpture kind of simultaneously because I was building up to produce some large scale sculptural works. And I started to fall in love with, I wanted to work on canvas and I wanted, you know, to think about color and text and how to um, make a painting that could um, work in a way sculpturally or think in terms of sculpture, which is, su which is a su some kind of way that I work a lot where I try to make one medium do the work of another. And so this work for me, I was really thinking about, you know, sculptural forms and what makes those things happen. Like how you think about weight and volume and mass and the body you know, uh, in relationship to forms and figures. And, and so this, this language kind of came out of thinking about um, the body in conversation with sculptural works. Um, and then the colors are, are really attached to um, the, the color palette of Jacob Lawrence's uh, um, migration series, although it's like expanded and, and I kind of fell in love with these colors um, that I'm kind of still meditating on and thinking about their this kind of groundedness between text and um color uh yeah so for me they are sculptural they're meant to be overwhelming um the language is meant to build a a a, a thinking space uh for the viewer you know, it's um, it's funny that you, not, I mean, not funny, but it's amazing that you're using the word word grounded, and I really feel that this work grounds where um, where it is right now in the galleries, and mm -hmm. it grounds the exhibition, the willfulness of objects. Some of you might have been to the museum since we opened. We have a new show, and most of the works are from the collection. There we go. This is kind of a more oh, that's a great view. view. Um, the willfulness of objects is about that power of objects. And some of you might know or might realize, or if you've been to the museum since we opened, um, the willfulness of objects really shows a lot of what we purchased in the last six years. And it's mainly sculpture. And when I saw this work for the first time, in my mind, it registered as sculpture. Mm. It felt like sculpture. And that's how it feels like in the space. And it's just, quite amazing that way. Um, 
I love that that it resonated with you that way because it is a conversation about the figure viewing sculpture and in interacting with sculpture. Um, and it's also part of my thinking of building other sculptures. So I think that it really makes sense that it that you saw it that way and that it it it, it grounded you in that way. That makes me so happy. Totally, totally. And it really grounds the exhibition. I think because of its work and its presence, I think that's kind of what comes across. Now that we're speaking about sculpture, can we go back, I think, to the first image where you have your, I is this the most recent project, the Socrates sculpture? Um, yes, that is that is the most recent project. That, is, that opened maybe a month ago. Um, this is the work that I was thinking about while I was making those paintings. Like this was the kind of conversations around the materials, um, around the figures, thinking about how to, you know, not only engage the viewer with the text, but also engage the viewer with the form and how the body could move around and be enticed to move around these three works. Um, so to make sure to pay attention to all sides of the sculpture, as well as the, the, the text, which is very weighted. I mean, you'd oftentimes when you think about text, you definitely think like 2D, like you think it has to be on, on something flat, normally on something, yeah. but seeing it as a sculpture is something very different. And you thought it was important to go around the object? Yeah, I mean, I paid, when I was, when we were designing it and thinking of it, I really paid attention to um, you know, the back of the, of the, I'm like, <laughs> like, as if I can reach it, um, the back of the, <laughs> the large scale one and, and the poles that hang, hold, hold it. And then with the white um, sculpture, it's really um, about the materials. Like we, I was thinking a lot about plaster and like kind of Adobe, like kind of textures. And I, and I wanted you to be able to walk around that and then still also, encounter the text because for me I mean even with um sequence you know language can overwhelm but there's also and I think in all my works always a pause inside of the works so there's always space for the viewer to kind of go in and have a moment you know to to reflect on what they're experiencing which is what the middle piece um, in this body of work kind of signifies this like a pause between these really intense um, text-based landscapes, basically. Amazing. So I have a question. Have you been able to do or think about performance throughout these months? Um, I haven't been thinking about doing performance, but I have obviously been thinking, I mean, I'm always thinking of all the ways that I work and inside of the language that I work. But I, I mean, I'm so full right now with so many beautiful projects that I'm excited about that um, I'm not ready actually to do performances because I'm still excited about painting. I'm still excited to make um, these, uh, sculptural works and photographic works and, and and I have been making photographic works that are performance based actually but they're not live performance based works I think yeah. this is probably one yeah this is one and and then this 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 has you know this is a performance based work and this is something that I have been thinking about lately. And if we go to the next slide probably there's a sundown series we'll keep keep going. Um, yeah, to this body of work. This is a body of work called the Sundown um, Sundown series that that showed originally in um, Miami at David Castillo Gallery and in a show called Sundown. Um, and I really, you know, that's performance for me. And this is a body of work that I will probably do for a really long time. And so I'm constantly thinking about performance because this body of work is constantly on my mind um, to produce, to work out and to think through. So oh, I loved uh, uh, just reading and learning about your performance work, the studio, the music studio that you had and kind of offered it up for people to use. Oh my goodness, so wow. It, 
Now, you know, it seems like that's so far away from our reality, but it's just so generous. Can you talk to us about that work? Yeah, that was a work, um, I believe that was produced in 2004 at Art in General. And um, it was a storefront where um, I invited, I, I covered the walls in jazz album covers and invited musicians to use the storefront space for rehearsals, performances, conversations. And then I would, I, I used to have a long DJ practice. So I would DJ um, from the collection. Uh, and that was up for about six months. And I also made a kind of long form video. And it's so interesting to think about that work given the times that we're in now, because that work was really about enticing the, 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 the passerby to come in and, and view the work. And now we're in a situation where we can't be as, you know, malleable in terms of the air that we share and the space that we share. It's so interesting that way. And, you know, what I've noticed is that we've kind of gone back to the 19th century in a way um, with museums. Now they're sort of more contemplative, more, I guess, quiet sort of the relationship between the viewer and the work is is more sort of um, I guess quiet and reflective and yeah maybe we needed that yeah I, I I I it's it's you know it's been interesting when you contemplate actually the internet itself and the fact that you know I would say in the mid-2000s when we all started to really use the internet you know, we started writing letters to each other. I mean, that's, you know, emails or letters, you know, we were constantly writing letters back and forth. And, and now we are slowed down again, where we are, yeah, we have to make appointments to go see things. We have to take our, we have to be very conscious of the time that we spend in spaces. Um, it's in, yeah, museums have now become so critical to people's ability to breathe, to socialize, to reflect. It's very, when you take in actually what is happening, it's very, um, even I have to pause thinking about it. It's not something we could have ever imagined and there's something really difficult about this time, but also something very special about what it's um, fertilizing for us as a, as a group, a human species, I guess. I think so too. And also but the relationship with yourself, I think is um, maybe some of us had lost that during all the noise and everything that was going on before this time. Yeah. I realize now that I go to galleries or museums and I'm just there by myself with the work. And that used to not really happen that much. And so I have time to think and I have time to observe and sort of have a relationship with the work. But it's also a relationship with myself. Yes. I had forgotten that kind of art viewing. Yeah, I don't know that I've really we've never I've never had a sustained I mean I guess when I was younger when I used to go like I grew up in New York City so I would go to the Met you know and I would get lost there as a child you know like a teen preteen a teenager I would get lost there and it was really about me looking at these objects and then as I've matured it's more about I'm you know as an artist a mature artist I'm always looking at you know, how things are constructed or, you know, the, 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 the variety of items or, you know, all these technical things. And now because we have time, I'm slowed down and I'm actually really looking at the work and considering and thinking about and, and enjoying and luxuriating is the word I want to use, right? Luxuriating. Um, I recently saw a, a show of paintings by, and I'm, I'm going to have to Google his, I always forget his name and I don't know why, um, but uh, okay, I'm looking him up right now. People, sh I'm gonna totally show him love because he's amazing. Louis Fratino's work, I don't know if everybody knows his work, is he has a beautiful show up at um, Sycamore Jenkins in, uh, in New York. And it just, I just was like, wow, like it just, 
opened up you know a lot of ideas inside of my own practice just looking at his beautiful show of paintings uh, he's a young 27 year old painter just beautiful beautiful work it's like we have the um i i love the word luxuriating i think i'm gonna write it down right now we can have that word <laughs> I love it. I don't even know how to write it, but I wrote, wrote so sort of wrote it down. I'm going to use it. Um, we, um, so one of the words that I've been using is savoring, but I think luxury is a better word because it, I, it draws in the luxury of the time and the savoring. So yes. past savoring and straight to the luxury of time. I like that a lot. Um, I took this course on um, Coursera and it's that famous Yale course about the um, something about well-being the art of well-being and it talks about thankfulness savoring you know all of those things that are strategies proven scientific strategies on how to be happier I guess you know and I don't normally like well like wellness books or whatever but I took the course because everybody's talking about it and um, this idea of savoring has become really important. Mm. And it's about that moment. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change the word savoring and luxuriate. You can you have it. Luxuriate. I say it all the time. <laughs> you know, I, lo I yeah. love to luxuriate, I guess, because I understand the opposite of it. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, ooh, I don't want that right now. I need to enjoy and indulge and and, and 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 be you know be thankful for yeah you know breath really absolutely especially in this time you know yeah. if you have a moment to luxuriate or savor or be thankful for just a little moment like what we're having now or you know going outside and smelling some grass or something you know it's just a good thing to keep in mind it is it is so what other pictures do we have here? What images do we have and that we want to talk about? Um, we have a good amount of images, I think. So if we want to pull okay. up um, the PowerPoint, um, we can kind of go through. Are these collages? Um, I can't see them, but uh, I don't think so. Let me see my, let me see if I can. There it is. Um, collages. You know, I've started making these works um, because I want if you, you know, the other works that you showed previously, the landscape based works. Um, I was, I was, I'm trained as a large format, like kind of like an Ansel Adams type of photographer where I go out with my large format camera. They're very heavy. Um, you know, they, I work with plates. Uh, you know, like film plates, big, large plates uh, that are fairly large. Um, and I would go outside and make a lot of works. And then I realized that I actually wanted to work inside of the studio. And I also wanted to think about sculpture. So here this, this language comes again. And I wanted to think about how to build a sculpture inside of photography. Um, and so I started making this series called the Index Composition Series. And these are, these are works to me, they're landscapes. They're very similar to the text works um, in that they're kind of landscape based um, and they are narrative based and they're built on the figure and then photographs. So they're not, they're not, I mean, they're, for me, they're sculptural works inside of a photography um, practice. Um, so, and, and I've made probably like 10 sets of these. So each set kind of in a way marks time, marks a moment in my studio practice. And also a lot of times points to other parts of the practice, like will point to photographic works that I've made kind of right before or after or text-based works that I've thought about before or after. And a lot of the times, um, like for instance, I've been, taking, I don't know if you guys can see, I can't see what you see, but I've been, you know, these will, these works, these like little Polaroids that I started taking, I don't know if you can see them, but um, they will go inside of these works because these works are also thinking a lot about photography and the different um, 
points of photography, the different textures of photography, the photograph itself, but also the history of photography, which has like many different twists and turns over its 150 year history. Can we scroll through a few, a few more images so we can see more? This is, um, these are, I, you know, last year I wanted to make animations. <laughs> so I, I, I worked with an animator and I made um, these long form, uh, hour long animations that are tied to, um, uh, this is a three channel video actually. So this is one channel, which is uh, these characters that kind of do these very monotonous kind of like continuous actions and then um but the 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 work is tied to labor actually it's a kind of a heavy work but i tried to give it again the word i'll use is pause i tried to give it a little levity and you know by using animation to kind of show labor and repetition and and that's something that i do a lot again is use um one form to make other works uh, that I can't work. Like I couldn't get a human being to do the things that these characters are doing, but I can get an animated figure to do those things. And animation is something that's really exciting to me, but I own that I'm not a trained animator. So that's why I use stick figures because I'm at the baby stages <laughs> with animation. <laughs> Um, so, but you do get human beings to do really amazing performances, not stick figures. So can we look at that first image that we saw of the humans? And then I found a quote here that you were talking about your, um, I think you were talking about the music performance. Yeah, well, definitely you were talking about the music performance. And it brings up um, something that I want to ask you about as we talk about your performances. You say, and I think you were referring to the storefront installation with the hip hop and the music, obviously. Um, it excites me to revive the elements of chance and surprise that early hip hop and turntable artists once confronted individuals in their communities with. So do you, do you use the elements of chance and surprise in these or are they highly choreographed or neither or some of it, a little bit of both? So for this work, um, you know, actually, I, my hand is pretty tight in everything. I am very intentional. And I think that has to do again with being trained on large format cameras and also being a trained actor. So the thing about training as an actor that I learned the most, and it's so cliche, but it's true, is that an actor prepares, right? Like I'm, I'm, I am pretty, I, for lack of a better word, I arm myself up with what I need to do the things that I need to do. And so chance is not really a part of my practice for the most part, I would say. Um, because I sketch most everything out. I write all of the ideas out. I, 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 you know, I have to plan images. I have to plan, you know, paintings. I plan it all, you know, but I, but I'm, I'm again, happy to think that it, through all of that labor and work and intentionality that it has a lightness, some of the works have a lightness to them or, or feeling of chance. But for instance, with this work, um, which is called number 21, I worked with, you know, I, I know some of these dancers, but I choreographed the, the entire body of work. And um, I worked with them to get the movements kind of clear but the movements were choreographed by me. And that was through planning. Um, sorry, I'm, I have something in my throat. So sorry, you guys. Um, you want to get water? No, I'm not going to get a water. I'm going to push through, but I just needed a second. <laughs> um, but, I, but I choreographed 
you know, and planned each gesture and moment. And that's looking at photography and thinking about how photography um, works and then thinking about how to build that into a choreographic work, basically. So not a lot of chance, although there is in one of my performances a chance operator, but that chance operator actually um, is highly scripted, actually. So I, you know, Maybe one day I'll get to chance, but I really enjoy having my hand inside of my work. So I'm not seeing the other slide, but I'm wondering if you want to show us something that I haven't asked you about, um, or you. Well, we can, we can, let's scroll, let's go, let's start at the top of the slides and we can scroll through. And then we'll go, well, not, we'll go forward. Okay, we talked about that. We just keep scrolling a little bit. We're gonna keep going. You so let's, we can talk about this body of work. We can okay. go back to the sundowns. Um, have you seen this body? I don't know if you saw the exhibition at David Castillo Gallery when it, yes. when it opened. Yeah, so this body of work, um, it actually is attached, well, it was when it was at David's Gallery, it was attached to furniture and, you know, sculptural, furniture, sculptural work, you know? And I was thinking about the home space and the domestic space and the safe kind of space and how to kind of complicate that. And then also, um, think about this kind of history, the, the history really of the United States actually, and how to kind of tease out that history through archival research. And, um, you know, so this is a, this is a body of work that I, again, will probably working, work on for a long period of time, because I really want to try to create like a huge atlas of images that, that kind of point you to an understanding of how the country was constructed and, and what kind of like lessons we need to kind of remember in terms of the, the, the structures of the country. So this is, you know, something that I've been doing as the pandemic has, has gone on. All right, how have the elements of being home contributed to this body of work? Mm, that's a great question. Mm, let, me, let me think about that. You can think about it, we can keep scrolling. No, I mean, I, I, you know, what's interesting about this work, usually um, I've been making these works, um, you know, for instance, with these backgrounds and in this kind of specific way. And during, as you know, we've been going on and on through the, through COVID, I started um, and, you'll see them hopefully next year sometime. I started going outdoors, which is, you know, again, like it's, a, it's an interesting conversation to have with one studio practice where, you know, I really love being inside for a while then I really love being outdoors. And I think because, you know, we have been spending so much time indoors and in studio or in home, I've been really excited to make some works outdoors, which is, not always how I like to work. So I think being home so much means that I probably a lot of work will, that'll start coming from my studio will be outdoors, which is really exciting me. I'm thinking about also how to bring communities, um, you know, that would normally be seeing things indoors, out, outdoors, how do you activate the outdoor space? So that's something that I'm thinking about and that might lead to performances outdoors or conversations outdoors. I'm not sure yet, I'm still kind of thinking through. Amazing, I actually have a question about that precisely, coincidentally. Um, so I could talk to you for hours on end because this is really interesting, but we promised ourselves that we were gonna keep it short because people get a little bit tired of being in front of the screen, especially at this time when maybe they've been working in front of a screen. So um, so how about we open it up to questions if it's okay with you? Of course, for sure. Okay, so I have a question that, you know, kind of I guess is a great segue to get into this is how does nature influence your work? 
This is Erica asking. Hi, Erica. Um, that's a really great question. I mean, I think nature, you know, in the broadest sense has always influenced my work. My earliest works were, you know, looking at art historically and thinking about the sublime and what characters can have art historically been inside of the sublime. And, you know, I, my studio is in the woods, deep, deep, my, my main studio is deep, 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 deep in the woods in upstate New York. And so I go from like this very urban experience to this very kind of rural, my neighbors are farmers, to this very rural experience. And I'm, you know, my house is surrounded. It's, a, it's it almost like a circle. The property is almost a circle. And I think a lot about, um, you know, I think inside of it and I also make inside of it. There's that side, but then there's also, you know, that's the lighter side. Then there's the heavier side because nature is complicated in the construction of the United States, you know, because nature for me is obviously tied to, you know, the thousands of tribes that foundationally live here, you know? And so then you, and then you have to layer that with like, the history of slavery and you know all of that so nature becomes complicated if you want it to be and then it also can be uh you know it's it's both a so a source of pause but it's also it can be also when you start to really understand the history it also can be a very heavy topic so i have to balance both of those things when i think about um nature nature I, especially i think right now where everything can be so heavy it's sort of you know going there and then coming back as we started talking about at the beginning of our um conversation so i will go with the next question which is um denise is asking Hi, i'm denise. familiar with your work entitled maps in 2020 oh wow did it come about and what were your intentions? Maps is from 2004, if I, if I'm, if, if Denise, if I'm thinking of the right, it's like 2000 or 2007 maps. Um, I, you know, I'm, or, you know, I'm constantly thinking of maps and I'm constantly thinking of different ways to produce a map. And it, I think because language is so critical to my practice, um, I use language to build other narratives. And what I mean by that is I have to like think of the, the word maps in like a few different ways. And I guess because this is a, a side note. My my partner, he speaks four languages. And so it's really beautiful to watch when we've traveled, it's really beautiful to watch him shift languages. And as a result of watching and listening to someone shift languages so effortlessly, is that my dance with English is different because I um I understand that words can chain you can you can mold words to have different meanings and so you know maps have a lot of different meanings for me besides the foundational way that we understand that word it also you know has to do with territories and it also has to do with constructing a new and it also has to do with marking but it also has to do with deconstructing um so i think you know, and then also about positioning. And so I think that those are the, the ways that I see um, using that word maps to describe one image. And I'm, and I'm very intentional with my, with the names of my works. So yeah, that's the long short of the yes. answer. I love it. Um, so another question by Andrea, what advice would you have for emerging artists in terms of what motivates and inspires you to keep creating? Mm, that's a great question. Thank you, Andrea. I'm going to breathe into that one. Um, 
Honestly, I would say you, as a, a, a emerging artist, you have to decide what turns you on. And what I mean by that is what excites you, what do you want to push up against, what breaks your heart, what totally opens you up, what, what, and then you have to go down the road of it. You have to have patience with it. You also have to you know, I mean, there's a practical like understanding your relationship to resources and, 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 and funds and how you're gonna spend your time. Let's say you're an emerging artist who needs to work. How much of, what do you need to survive, to live comfortable, to live the, you know, have a place, have food. And then how, and then how, what do you need? How much time do you need to make work? You know, like how, what, how long, how many hours in the day do you need to work to have food on the table or, uh, you know, have a job that you need to do? And then what are the hours that you can put into your labor as an artist? And, you know, hopefully what can happen is over time, you start to put more labor and more hours into this part and you... You, you let go of this part, which is the practical, right? And you start to get deeper into the making. And hopefully that will lead to you also, you know, getting resources for the making more and more and more. I mean, that's, you know, I think there's, there's because of the system that we have in the United States, you know, um, other countries have different systems that support artists you know we have a, another system so you have to figure out how to sustain yourself while you are producing and I but but more importantly beyond all of that it's really what excites you what heartbreaks you what turns you on to do something and how do you sustain that fire over a long period of time and practically I would say read read watch look at art go to museums you know, talk to curators, talk to fellow artists and, 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 and then have patience. Just, just do the work and then have patience. Um, and but the most important part is to just to, act, to do it, to actually do it. I think that's the best answer to that question that I hear probably every week um, that I've ever heard. Really. Wow. When, when you answer that question, what kept coming to my mind was wrestling match. And it almost felt like you were wrestling with your career calling, um, you know, vocation, whatever it is that we call what we do. Um, it almost sounded like you were wrestling with it. Like there was a fight and you were fighting it, but not fighting it. And, you know, all of those negotiations, I think that we, as, like, I'm not an artist, but but when you're in this realm, it's it's a fight. Yeah. And sometimes you're you're mad <laughs> at it. And sometimes you're really happy at it. But that's how it sounded and I loved hearing it. Oh, that makes me happy. Cause that, that I mean, it's 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 yeah, this is the movement I wanna do, right? Like it's it's a push and pull. <laughs> it's a push and pull, you know? Mm -hmm. And you have to find comfort. And, you know, David Hammond said something, I think that is really, I, and I'm paraphrasing, but he basically said, you know, artists are like monks, you know, like we, and, and what I add to that is because of that, you have to recognize your relationship to resources because you, you, we, you just don't know how it's going to go, but you have to decide to keep going. Um, through it and so yeah that's the push and pull yeah amazing so last question before we close and we say goodbye is comes from Sarah and she says um has Averia been to the museum or planning to and what cocktail is she pairing with her recipe tonight Oh, that's nice. So I haven't come to the museum and seen my, hi, Sarah. I haven't seen my work on view, but I will be there because I'm going to be, I have a great partner who drives everywhere. He's, we're actually, his family has, um, lives in, on the Gulf. So I'm going to 
come to Miami sometime this winter. How long is the show up? Uh, a long time. <laughs> okay, good. And great. So I'll be there. And, and I'm so excited to see the work installed. I, I love that it's in the collection. I, Miami has such a, you guys don't even know. I mean, A, my, my gallerist, who's also my, one of my dearest, most amazing friends, David Castillo and his partner, Pepe, that, you know what I mean? Those are like my, 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 my dear friends. Um, but also, uh, yeah, I'm excited to see the show and see them and see all that and see you. Um, and cocktail, you know, I've been really into margaritas. I know it sounds very parochial, but like, or basic, I don't know, but I've just been, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I like can't wait. Like I really, I've been really enjoying, um, I, I, I like really beautiful tequila or um, mezcal and um, I, I love making my juice myself, my lemon lime juice or, you know, whatever. And I use maple syrup and I salt the rim and that, you know, I mean, and I enjoy that. So that's probably what I'll have tonight. Um, so margaritas and homemade tortillas. I know. Yes, yes. You're definitely in a Mexican mood. So I, which I, I love to make all the time. I, I mean, I love, <laughs> I love, I love. Well, I have a chilaquiles recipe that's really good and I'll send it to you. Please, please, yeah. please do. So Zaveria, thank you so much. This has been delightful. Thank you. I loved all the moments we hit. I'm going to miss you all. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll come down soon. Yeah. I want to thank everybody for joining us for this really fun small talks. And again, thank Art Bridges for sponsoring it. Thanks, Art Bridges. Have a good night. Bye. Bye.